so just a couple of questions and then i think we'll take some more questions one of the so we are doing this course for the last uh, few weeks mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of the very important questions sir is uh, about intercurrent remedies and of course i have studied from you as many of the participants i already talked to you about talk about you to them but what i want you to talk about is for example a intercurrent remedy could actually much later in our analysis we come to know it could be actually a deeper remedy yep in in that particular case can you share a little bit about intercurrent remedies in context of miasm in context of deeper remedies as well and your experiences so uh, <clears throat> intercurrent remedies basically uh, it is as the definition says it's something that goes in the current of the treatment when patients stop responding or they keep slipping back or you find that there's not much of a uh, you don't get the what you wanted that's not the response that you got then you need to look at uh, an intercurrent remedy so there is some sort of a block now that block doesn't always have to be a miasmatic block sometimes the block is uh, more like a chronic trauma chronic injury it could be a chronic trauma at the mental level it could be a chronic trauma at the physical level i have had some cases of uh, uh, gout that didn't respond to the uh, remedy till we gave arnica to them because of the history of chronic injury to that toe and later they developed gout and we gave what we thought was the remedy for that person based on the symptoms of course if you now then later when you read up you'll realize that arnica is also a very important remedy for gout but we consider arnica only for injuries and we keep giving it for injuries so here the block was injury and you gave arnica and you find that it helps to take care of uh, and it helps to make the patient move forwards sometimes you find that uh you have given a remedy and it doesn't seem to work as well because of the fact that they do not have the capacity to react for example uh you have kali carbonicum you have given kali carb to a patient and you expect them to respond but they do to a point and then they stop responding and you keep racking your brain why is it happening you think of giving a higher potency it doesn't help that's the time you should consider whether uh, the patient does the patient have the capacity to react to the homeopathic remedy you have the right remedy but maybe the patient needs something to first stir up the susceptibility to stir up the vital force so that it reacts and that's the time you would give a drug like carbovag now carbovag and calicarb are related to each other both have a tendency to uh, flatulence every day they eat turns into gas both have a lot of similarities and you find that if you read in borikis materia medica you will find he mentions there in the in the relationship that uh, carbovag would be the remedy you could think of when calicarb has been given and it doesn't seem to work because the patient doesn't have the strength to react and carbovag will help with increasing a susceptibility of the patient we know carbovag is the standard thing that is taught to all students is it's a corpse survivor or a corpse reviver reviver because of the fact that they don't have the capacity to react and they are dying and you give carbovag and sometimes miraculously the patient comes back to life or starts <clears throat> getting back the vital uh, uh, the force comes back to normal so this carbovag here is given not to to revive the patient but to improve the susceptibility to a point where calicarb can now act so intercurrents are not just anti miasmatic intercurrent could be any remedy that would help in continuing with the current or the flow of the previous remedy it could be something that is complementary to it it could be some maybe some uh, you've been giving an acute remedy and now you have to follow up with a deep acting chronic remedy or it could be an anti miasmatic remedy similarly when you are talking about miasmatic prescription it doesn't mean you have to only give sorinum or you have to give only sifilanum or you have to give only thuja or you have to give only 
bacillinum or tuberculinum, we are looking at any remedy that has that myosin prominent. So don't consider myosinmatic prescriptions to be only those nosodes. Nosodes are part of it, but all our remedies have some myosin which is predominant. And that is what is uh, more important for us to understand when you say myosinmatic prescription. So I hope this uh, convoluted answer is possibly given some, <laughs> thrown some light on what, what you are asking. Yes, of course, everything that you say is very important for us, sir. I've seen you and I've learned from you a lot of use of uh, smaller remedies. Uh, mm -hmm. As you always used to teach us that uh, rare remedies are rare because they are used rarely, a famous statement. But what I want you to talk to talk to us or just enlighten us about your experiences, many of these smaller remedies, the miasm is not clear. Maybe it's not been proved at that level. Maybe many homeopaths or of course, uh, the proving has been done after Hanuman. What is your thought about this lesser known smaller <clears throat> remedies, maybe in Boric or other Clark or something? And how do we understand miasmatic patterns or so, uh, what is your I mean, thought? It, it, see, the thing is, just because <clears throat> the, uh, the, the well-known homeopaths of the past, the, the, so what people like to call as the masters. So all the, all the previous teachers of homeopathy, uh, just because they haven't classified a drug into a particular miasm doesn't mean that miasm doesn't exist in that drug. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a good clinical understanding of the miasm, you know what are the miasmatic uh, uh, indications or symptoms so you know, like we went through the uh, four miasms today and we saw what the psoric mm -hmm. miasm symptoms are, what the psychotic miasm symptoms are. It's easy for you to, uh, when you're reading a remedy, to, to know which miasm is most prominent. Now, for example, eel serum is given so commonly in patients with uh, renal failure. Renal or... failure. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a, it's a drug that covers three myasms actually, the psychotic state, because it's also a good drug for its action in the heart. People don't talk about, read about that. They only concentrate on what has been told to them and that remains stereotype uh, picture of. So it, acts, it has some action on different parts of the body. There is some amount of uh, stagnation initially, there's some amount of slowing down and then gradually there's degeneration and destruction. And then you find it's a drug for chronic kidney disease where you find it, uh, patients will have uh, creatinine levels going up, the blood urea goes up. So you then know that this is now the syphilitic miasm. So uh, you might still want to give a deep acting constitutional remedy and consider giving uh, eel serum as and when needed, whenever there's a crisis. So every drug can, even an acute remedy will have, as I talked earlier, I don't know if you were around when we talked about belladonna and Syncona. We talked about the acute uh, symptoms, one being from the psoric state and one being from the psychotic or tubercular state. So every drug can have a miasmatic uh, basis and you just have to be able to uh, use your knowledge of miasms to decide which is the predominant miasm, even in the smaller remedies. Yes, because sometimes Boric has written one or two just words there, like in Pedicus yeah, Capitis, he's right. written Soric Manifestations. Or somewhere right. he's just written one word and it's it's a little puzzle, but it's it's quite interesting. That maybe he's telling the reader study more or something like that. But then Boric has also, it's concise. So you need to then go back to the source books. Try to find out uh, uh, whatever you can about the original proving. Go back to, it's maybe it could be from Herring's Guiding Symptoms or... Allen's Encyclopedia, see if you have more indications or Clark's Dictionary of Practical Material Medica, where he combines his clinical as well as uh, uh, the proving symptoms. So you will always find some clues. And if you find that it's just one or two lines given in a book, it's very doubtful that that remedy might be very useful in conditions. It's just like throwing an arrow in the dark and you might miss or you might hit. So that's a, that's a dangerous way to prescribe prescribing only on one symptom or prescribing only on one keynote and uh, uh, trying yeah. to treat a very uh, major illness in the person. And finally, the, the last question is about, um, I remember uh, learning from you this again about um, the physical traits 
um, of course in our materia medica the words like psychotic taint syphilitic taint these words are used and and i remember discussing this with you in uh, about 15 years back about physical traits and how to know just by looking at certain physical traits the clinical differentiation of miasm and i remember you uh, sharing with me the book phyllis spite where mm. there is a, a table of all the miasms and right. how to differentiate you know maybe you can share a little bit about physical traits how to differentiate and which books further to understand clinical practical usage of miasm because this is a big question for all our friends who have joined here right so as you rightly said uh, the comparison of the chronic miasms <clears throat> by Phyllis Pate. So the, my initial uh, part of my lecture where we, I talked about, where I gave references to Alan and uh, Kent and Roberts, they're actually part of the foreword of uh, Phyllis Pate. So it's very important. Uh, in fact, that also brings me to another point. Whichever book you read, start with the first page and don't stop till you finish the last page. So every, mm -hmm. every sentence, every mm -hmm. word has importance from the uh, front page or the cover of the book all the way to the back cover everything that you read you'll find is useful to you somewhere or the other and this forward is very important because it gives you a lot of important idea about miasms and uh, phyllis pate has actually uh, tried to classify the four miasms and and made it simplified how to compare the different miasms Ortega. Ortega's miasm is also very important. I don't know if any of notes you know, notes on miasm by Ortega. Yeah, so I don't know how many people use that, but they're very important. Most of the stuff that we see now is just uh, old wine in new bottles. People are mm -hmm. just using the same things. Like even today, I talked about stuff that I, I mean, everyone knows. It's just that I'm trying to give it a clinical look instead of just yeah. talking about. So Ortega, uh, Phyllis Pite, these two would be the books. Dr. Sristi will write it on the webinar chat. Yeah. Which other books would you recommend? Because it's very important for us to go to the source and study. And I know that you are a person who would want to share this with our friends. So uh, one other author that has not been uh, given so much importance is uh, uh, E.A. Farrington. Mm. His, his clinical material medica has got a lot of uh, hints mm. about not just the drugs, but even the miasm, miasms involved. Okay. So that's one uh, book you should be reading. He has written in the uh, many families he has written together. Yes, that's, that's again. So that's what I'm trying to get back to. What we now, there's a resurgence of the kingdoms. Yes. And he, many... Uh, more than a hundred years ago, he had talked about classifying Absolutely. the remedies into kingdoms and the families. It's so fascinating so, that book is. So it's all there. It says that because people don't read those books, uh, uh, people uh, others have to come and give it to you in a different form, so and make it more interesting. Same with auto laser. Auto lasers. Uh, auto laser. Yeah. Auto laser has uh, written. Mineral about, kingdom. I think he has written on. And he's also written about the periodic table which yes, is so yes. much use in use nowadays very, very and in vogue, but it's all there. It's all there in all our books. It says that yes. we don't see, we don't look for it and true, we don't want true. to really go through it. So keep reading. You will find that uh, there's no one particular person who has written something good about miasms, but you mm -hmm. find that every time you read something, you'll always pick up a lot of hints about the, yes. uh, even Clark's Dictionary of Practical Material America is a treasure house. And you'll find a lot of stuff there that uh, he has, he normally gives a lot of his cases or he talks about other people's cases and uh, guiding indications for it with sometimes the miasm involved. So mm -hmm. it's very important for us to, uh, as I said in the beginning of the session, be learners. You need to be a learner throughout your life. I still am a student of homeopathy, even though right now I'm teaching you all, but for yes. me, every day is a learning point. <laughs> Perfect. Dr. Sristi, just take two or three important questions you wish to, and we will let sir go. It's, it's, uh, yes, sir. We have stretched the lecture. Already 10 PM for you guys in India. <laughs> yeah. Sunday, 10 PM and our friends are all alive and very excited to learn. So sir, very passionate homeopaths we have. Who, who who are studying with us. Nice.
Okay, so I'll take uh, just few questions which are important for the session that we have done. Um, so first question is acute diseases are nothing but transient explosion of latent SORA. Does that mean that SORA is responsible for all the acutes? So can you please share your thoughts about this? So not all the acutes, you can say most of the acutes. So uh, uh, in light of modern uh, knowledge of pathology, you would like to possibly make slight changes to what has been talked about things in the past. So you cannot say it is, uh, like for example, Sora is responsible for seven eighths of all the chronic diseases. Exactly, yes. Right, now <laughs> in the current age, I think we have gone to a stage where uh, the other miasms have become much more prominent and the miasmatic, uh, uh, diseases of that, those particular miasms are much more than uh, the soric manifestations. So people are living a much simpler life, maybe two, 300 years ago, or even earlier than that. And things have changed. Things have changed so much that uh, there are so many things we are ingesting, like microplastics. Everything has got microplastics. Even your tea bags have microplastics. So uh, you are being exposed to so many different things radiations, chemicals, medications, all of them are going to cause their own influence on the person and you're no longer going to find Sora is the seven eighth of all diseases. Sora might be now only maybe two eighths or three eighths of uh, all the myasms and the other myasms have possibly taken over. So initially, yes, it's the beginning of it. People are not also born in the soric phase. Some of them may be born stayed in the psychotic or the syphilitic phase. So same with the acute conditions. It was mentioned at one time that it's a acute exact uh, outpouring of the soric manifestation, but then you will also find that patients with <coughs> uh, syphilitic miasm being prominent will get acute uh, problems, but you will find that the remedies that are needed are also, as I said earlier, more likely to be syphilitic, even though they are... Uh, acute in uh, origin, they are, more, they are more likely to have some syphilitic manifestation. And that's what you're going to be prescribing on. So you might also want to look at, uh, you might want to revise your understanding of some of the things that were taught to us in the past in light, in view of the fact that uh, things are changing, diseases are changing, the types of illnesses are changing. And that's what is more important for us to keep in mind.